Well, welcome everyone to the School of Greatness podcast. We're, our guest today is Corey Gregory. He's the, co- uh, the, the host of a podcast and author of a book called The Mindset Manual. Make sure you guys check this thing out. We'll be talking about this today. But Corey, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate OH, you. baby. What's up, Ohio, Lewis? Ohio, man. <laughs> Ohio in the house, Columbus, Ohio specifically. You've got a gym in Columbus, Ohio called the Old School Gym, right? Correct. And Join a real gym dot com. <laughs> there you go. I swear to you. <laughs> and uh, it's like the most real, raw, old school type of gym you can ever yeah. work out in. You're also one of the co-founders, former president of Muscle Farm, which yep. sold a half a billion dollars in supplements. Correct. Yep, absolutely. And um, fun fact about you is you are a coal miner at one point. Yeah, coal miner for six months is how I saved my money for my first gym that I started in uh, 1999. Okay. Coal miner, was this in college or was high school? What was this? Yeah, so right out of high school, um, I was really kind of like, what am I going to do with my life? Mm Because at the end of the day, I was like, well, I really like to lift weights. Right. And no one really had a path for me on how to make money. Yeah, exactly. Right. My parents thought I was in trouble. I'm graduating to 2.1 and I'm like, I really just like to lift weights. And so my stepdad got me a job. He said, look, I was working at a sawmill and going to like community college, like right out of uh, school. And it was like, uh, it just didn't feel good at all. And he was like, look, I know you want to leave here. I'll get you a job as a coal miner, $14, $14 an hour. And then it's not bad. No. And you can work as much overtime as you want. So overtime is like about 21 bucks. Well, I literally would work 90 hours per pay, which is a week. So not like, you know, you get like your paycheck every two weeks. Mine was per week. So I'd work between a day or something. Yeah. Easily doubles, all kinds of stuff. And so I would work my biggest paycheck, I think was like 92 and a half hours for the week. I literally just lifted weights got the paychecks and put them on my desk. When I quit there six months later, I had like four or five paychecks stacked up on it. Like I didn't even have time to go to the bank. Like I just was so focused on working and moving to Columbus so I could start to live my dream of being a fitness guy. And were you in West Virginia then? Is that no, where still I in Ohio. What, just east, in Ohio. Yeah, like Southeast Ohio. Um, okay. I'm from the Steubenville, Caddis, like Ohio Valley area. Gotcha. So Southeast, coal mines everywhere. Close to West Virginia. Though, yeah, right, right across right across the panhandle. Yeah, yeah yep, gotcha. Right on the river. And so, you know, when was this? How many years ago? This is in, uh, <laughs> so I graduated high school in 97. So this is like 90, 20 years ago. 98, 99, yeah. Okay. It's crazy. 17, 18 years ago. And you, why did you want to move to Columbus to start, you know, this fitness gym? Yeah, and- so I, there was really no reason except for all my friends that did go to college. Yeah. Um, a, a group of them, probably six or seven, was migrating to Columbus. Right, to go to Ohio and, State. Or yeah, Ohio yeah. State. And I looked up that the Columbus State Community College had a one-year exercise specialist program. Well, so I was like, okay, I can go there. One year pay twenty five hundred bucks for, you know, community college and then become a trainer. And so what was funny is as I got there and I was in class and I was still not really super engaged. I liked it, but mm-hmm. not I'm just not a school dude. It just is what it is. And I started working under a trainer that was really doing well. Like he was probably making six figures on the east side of Columbus, which is pretty good for a personal trainer at that time. I started learning from him and six months into it, he started getting a little bit busy. So he's like, Man, you here's a client. And then I'd, you know, meet somebody else, another client before you know it, like six months in, I'm already working as a trainer. Right. When I so-called graduated with my one-year degree, I didn't even show up. I just said, send in the mail. Right. Like, cause I was already, <laughs> already you know, making money. I'm already making money. You and don't so, need the proof of a certificate no. or. Yeah. So at 20 years old, I'm in my profession. Now, do I know a ton at that point? No, I'm learning on the fly, but it's like fast forward, like the, the club started getting like a little bit antsy on trying to take a little bit more of my money. Cause I was doing okay. Mm-hmm. And I literally like had kind of an argument with the manager and said, you know what? I think it's time for me to open my own place. And so dude, I'm 20 years old. I walk out that day and start driving around looking for storefronts. I have no clue what I'm getting myself into. Right. Right. A lot of overhead, a lot of experience. Oh, you don't know. You know, so I find literally Lewis, you'd crack up. Like it was a almost, it was a ladder closet on the inside of a mini mall in Columbus, (laughs) in Reynoldsburg. Uh You're familiar with Columbus. This guy rented it to me for 600 bucks a month. And plus with utilities and everything, I was paying it for like twelve, thirteen hundred. I took right. a four thousand dollar credit card loan out. A bunch of my clients who were with me, there's like twelve or fifteen people gave me stuff. And the first personal training studio opened literally when I was twenty and a half. So I, I literally celebrated my twenty first birthday um, a couple you know, months later as a entrepreneur in my own gym essentially. But when I say gym, that's loose. It's like dumbbells, one mirror, and like right. a treadmill like from a yard sale. Oh yeah, it's, it's like, like the size. Yeah, it's small, but Everybody supported me, and that started like the dream right there. Sure. And I walked in every day, and I was like, "Man, this is—I just got to grind it out." And this is this is the beginning. And even mm. at that point, 
I felt somewhat successful because, I mean, I was a coal miner two years before that. Right. No one had any clue how to make money lifting weights. And here I am, barely 21, and somebody's paying me 20 bucks an hour to tell them how to do bicep curls. Right. So I'm thinking, I'm winning already. Yeah, of course. You know, so it was exciting, wow. man. It's crazy. What did you think about when you are in the coal mine? What was your thought process every day? Because yeah. I'm sure that was monotonous. I mean, it was probably a lot like lifting, a lot of hard it work. Is. You're like just doing the same thing over and over. Sure. Um, were you dreaming a lot? Were you yes. like... Absolutely. I was super focused. Like, so what's interesting about coal mining, a lot of people don't know, it's obviously super dangerous, but like, you know, I was called a red hat. So I was like college help. So they're like, give me the crappiest jobs ever. Right, right. So they're like, literally it'd be like working under this kitchen table, but shoveling for 13 hours, Ugh. you know what I mean? Under the desk. So like I'd be in this 42 inches of top, which is mean the ceiling. And I'd be shoveling onto this no. belt line as the, as the coal's going out of the, and there's like miles of this belt line. And what happened is coal would fall off of it. And there'd just be like, tons of it laying they'd be like they drop you off and say okay see you in 15 hours and just pick it up put it on the belt yeah just all day long you have knee pads and you're like <clears> my, <throat> you know it, there's Gosh. water dripping on me and it's in and, and i'm thinking to myself and, and here's what's funny because my friends used to call me the real zoolander all the time because the coal miner model thing sure sure and i but i literally <laughs> thought to myself okay if i can just make it through this no one's gonna have this story literally yeah. Yeah. If I believe in myself enough to save this money, grind this out, I mean, obviously it made me strong too. There's no doubt for my lifting career, but like no one in the city will have this story. You also knew that you had a defined ending. You had a definite Correct. ending. You weren't like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Yeah. Like. No. I knew no doubt knew I was saving six months. Money. Yeah. This was it. Like I'm done. I will tell you that at points because I'm a fourth generation coal miner. I'm a fourth generation coal miner and lifter both. And so like it was actually very natural to me. So, and, and I'm strong already from all the lifting. So I was, dad was a coal miner, dad, my grandfather, my great grandfather, mm -hmm. my great grandfather, um, died in a coal mine explosion in 1936. When my grandfather who taught me how to lift weights was nine years old, he's wow. 90 today, still wow. active. Wow. And so it's like, it's literally the family tree. And so I talk about this on every podcast I've been on. It was like, it was time for somebody to like put the grill on their back and say like, it stops here. Like it's not going to keep going. Right, right, right. And so I think that part of mm -hmm. like, we talk about purpose and passion. Like I embodied that to a high level. I was like, I'm going to do this so I can experience it. Cause right. that's my way out. Yeah. But like my kids aren't going to do it, you know, and, and, and the way they see me operates completely different than my parents. Right. And so like somebody has to break that family kind of course. tree in a good way. Mm -hmm. And so like, I respect the blue collar, like it made me who I am, but it, I knew it wasn't for me long term, but I was good. I, I was good at it when I did it. Right. Though. But you learned how to use hard work mentality yeah. and to multiply it and scale that energy. Absolutely. To maximize your results yeah. as opposed to just like, you know, yeah. trade for sitting under a desk, yeah. shoveling coal all day. Yeah. I mean, 15 bucks an hour. It's one of those things where like, I'm so glad I went through it Yeah, because it made me just completely different. I hear you, man. When I was uh, in between college and trying to go play professional football, mm -hmm. I took a three-month truck driving job. Nice. Because the workouts with the arena team were in the morning Sure. from like 8 to 10, so I couldn't start at 9 a job. And yeah. then they would do it at like 6 to 8 as well at night. So I needed some time in between, like mm -hmm. six-hour window. And yeah. I found this truck driving job driving Napa car parts okay. in Columbus and Cincinnati and back every single day. Wow. And it was the, it was the biggest truck. It was like a huge U-Haul mm -hmm. before you had to get like the truck license. Sure. So you could just have a normal license. Because you have a CDL, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, it only went 55 miles an hour on, what is it, Highway 70? Yeah, I yeah. Don't, what is the uh, 71? 71. Yep. Yeah, that goes down. And uh, man, it was the most miserable like six hours a day. Just like <laughs> pedal to the metal, 55, watching Ugh. everyone go by me, moving parts and coming back every single day. It just makes you realize you don't want to do that your whole life. I, I was just like, I'm never, ever yes. going to do this again. It was so glad I did an experience for three months. Yeah. I was like, I never want to feel this way ever again. I wanted to feel what my family's felt. Mm. I wanted to understand what it is to put in a double, like, like in some real conditions. Yeah. And so like, <clears throat> it, it was an amazing experience for me. And I mean, once again, no one has that story. Yeah. That's cool. Like, and to, and to me, like when you, when I tell people, like, cause the people always just like kind of prejudge you, right? Oh, you're probably the dude that always had abs right. or, oh, you probably like maybe had somebody kind of give you a lob pass. When I say I was a coal miner, they go, what? Like people even do that anymore? Like, you know <laughs> right, what I'm saying? Right. Like it's just, it's Are there just machines for that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, I, I felt blessed to be able to experience that and not get hurt and, right. and be able to move on to live my dream.
so you you started doing this personal training in a closet in a basically a mall. yeah <laughs> and then when did things start to pick up when did you build into the bigger gym that you have now sure you also you also were the president of muscle farm for how mm. many years? And yeah. When did this all kind of come? So about? the personal training thing lasted about a decade. Mm. I basically um, I was in that closet, made it a little nicer over the next two and a half, three years. Opened up a, a next studio, like basically upgraded to one that was uh, I think about three thousand square feet. I had about seven trainers working for me. Mm. So I grinded in that game yeah, yeah. for like a while, and then I bought the original old school with my high school lifting uh, partner Dustin Myers, who owns the current old school with me too. So we had two gyms for a little while. So this is probably two thousand six. I'm doing real good in my area. Like I'm easily making six figures. Like I'm, I'm you know, at, at this point, like if I was done, I'm still successful yeah, for yeah. what I tried to accomplish. Sure. All this other stuff is just gravy, Lewis, really. Yeah, of course. So it's like, so I'm looking at this and, and I'm like, I started, I was known in my area for the condition I got into. I did drug-free bodybuilding shows, powerlifting events. People were always coming to me for diet and stuff like that. Mm. And I just really like supplements. So, and I would love Bill Phillips as we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, Bill great. is like the G, right? So, um, in 2006, I started messing around with some proteins with um, one of my mentors, Dr. Eric Serrano. Dr. Eric Serrano and Dr. Mario Di Pasquale were really known for like high fat dieting, for amino acids, and all this kind of like cutting edge stuff. And I was friends with both of them and they helped me. So, yeah. I learned. So, I didn't have like a traditional education, but I got around some like right. real deal cats. Mm -hmm. and, and I just searched them out. I mean, Serrano, I read about him and realized his office was in Pickerington. Dude, I showed up to his office wow. six times before you would see me. Sure. And so finally, he's like on the sixth time, he's like, what do you want? And I said, dude, <laughs> I think we should be friends because I want to learn from you. Yeah. And he was just like, so he was like, well, okay, cool. Like, and so it's like I created these relationships. So about 2008, I was starting to get tired of personal training. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I was baby. You weren't baby. growing. You were just like. No, I was the same. And like I said, like it just felt like I needed something else. And honestly, I wanted to roll the dice off the wall once and try to be Bill Phillips. Right. A newer version or whatever right, I could right, try right, to right. do. That was my idol in that standpoint. Arnold was always my ultimate idol. Bill from a business like supplements. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> so, and I was like, I need to roll the dice once. I met my partner who, uh, Brad, who understood like manufacturing a lot more than I did. And I had the real concept, I think, from a customer service, from a content, like what people wanted. Because I was that guy for so mm -hmm. many years. I always think like, what would I want from a supplement company? And I created it. Yeah. Brad, Brad had a great vision of being with the UFC early. We started sponsoring the UFC fighters like 2008. Wow. So when it was on spike, <laughs> um, we uh, we rolled the dice multiple times. And, and I'll tell you what, Muscle Farm. When Farm's, did Muscle Farm start? So September of 2008 is when we sold our first product. Wow. We did um, a million dollars so in revenue. eight rev years ago. Yeah, eight years. So I did that. So I did personal training for 10 years and Muscle Farm for about eight years. Mm. I've been in the game, you know, about 18 years. I'll be 38 uh, actually in a couple of days. So, so I've been, you know, full-time entrepreneur fitness 18 years, which is crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. But so uh, we went from scratch idea in uh, August or April, I'd say, of 08. First product for sale in September. The first calendar year we were in business, which would have been 2009, we did a million dollars in sales. Then jumped to four, 20, 70, 120, 100. I mean, it just continued to grow. And what I'll tell you is there's a lot of wins about Muscle Farm. It was an awesome experience. Built a brand, sold in 40,000 doors, 100 countries. I mean, lived some mm. crazy, you know, it was a crazy ride. Yeah. There's a lot of losses too because, you know, at certain times the growth is just as we're, is just as bad as not growing. Like if you don't have the right people in the right places and the operations roles or this or that. And so like I was really in kind of a natural like marketing role, customer service. So I built the whole social media platform, which in our industry was definitely cutting edge. And, um, but yeah, I mean, hindsight 2020, you look back, you wish you could change a few things, but man, I, I mean, overall we crushed it. Wow. And so moving on from muscle farm, it's, I'm having a blast right yeah. now with all these new ventures. What would you say are the key ingredients that took it from 1 million to wherever it was before yeah. you left, like what were the things that worked really well? Like the must have things yeah. that like, I think because of this, it worked. I think it's multiple things. Yeah. I think timing of the UFC was huge. Getting a partnership with them. No yeah. one else had a partnership with them. No at one the time, believed right? in it. And everybody said it don't work in our industry. And we were like, okay, whatever. Well, at the end of the day, there's a ton of 25 year old kids watching the UFC, especially when it was on spike, when yeah. it was free. So I think that was one. I think the colors. Could, were you able to have a direct correlation, like track that? So you couldn't. That was kind of the problem. Just so like we put money there and we had we built a bigger company. So here's what I would say. <laughs> but, and I'd be in multiple Wall Street meetings like this. Yes. They'd say, how do you track that the UFC is working? I was like, okay. So we spend money in the UFC and then I have a whole social media thing that's free. And we're quadrupling sales every year. So you tell me it doesn't work. 
And that was the only thing you were spending money on at the time? Or yeah. Or trying a little other things? We really there? didn't do that much print Social advertising. Media, Social media was like even, it was mostly organic at that time. Facebook didn't have right. the ads. I mean. Trade shows maybe you were trade doing. Trade shows were big. So it was really like trade shows, UFC, Social media. So when I would sit down with an investor that, you know, I mean, look, Brad was uh, an NFL guy that had some problems with business in the past. I was a personal trainer that barely right. ran a business over $100,000 in sales. Right. So I'm telling him, like, we need to spend all our money in the UFC and social media. And at that point, Twitter had been around for like two years. I mean, yeah. so people were like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, what I will tell you about MuscleForm was great is that we looked like the Nike of the space. No one had great seen branding. a true brand. Yeah. And so I would tell you the big thing was a real brand. Maybe Muscle Milk was doing a okay job. They were doing job. good, but it's st- and they're less supplements. They're more protein. They're right? just protein. Yeah. And so like Muscle Farms brand was so dope. Um, I think honestly, and I w- I'm a real lifter, and I'm real. Like I was on social media answering. I answered every tweet, every Facebook post, everything for years. I mean, like, and I still do because I know the value in. Yeah. If Bill Phillips would have answered me. I would have always taken his supplements. I did anyway, time. just because of the stuff he wrote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. wrote you know what I mean? And so the it's brand like, he built. Absolutely. So I really just thought, what would what would I want Bill to do do to me if I was taking his supplements and, and he was in this age? And so literally, if you you tweeted me and asked me how to take creatine, I tell you, same thing to now. People tweet me, hey Corey, how do I you know what do I what's my new stack and your new products? Like what workout should I do? I answer everybody, man. I just think it's really yeah. important. So I, like, and yeah. I'm and I'm a gr- I'm a grinder, dude. Like. I'm still in the gym every day. No one cares that 4 I'm... 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Yeah, 4 a.m. crew. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at old school. No one cares that I built Muscle Farm. They're trying to beat me in squats every day. Yeah. They don't care. So my gym is not like that. So, and I think that's what kept it real. We could be as big as we were, but it it, it, it really didn't matter to me. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that stuff kept it real for me. So really caring about the customer, answering Huge. questions, developing a quality brand. Quality products on top of it. Quality products, yeah. quality branding that looked cool. Yeah. And also sponsoring the right yeah the right partners the right platform which Absolutely. was UFC at the time which is probably may not work for a new company now yeah well it'd be hard it to do it so now yeah. And, yeah I think we might be the last Mohican on that one right buddy to be honest <laughs> and what was that deal like are you allowed to share those numbers or uh, it's a couple million dollars a year to yeah. to have like the official sponsorship but honestly we on didn't the, on the yeah but we didn't have to have that at first we just sponsored the fighters yeah and UFC one on one just yeah their pants, their UFC 100 this is a it was a big turning point for us we had 10 fighters that wore the muscle farm logo Shut on their up. butt so Dana no White, way. Dana White literally came in. So I was fighting. I was getting both guys. If you were fighting and you're on TV for 15 minutes, it's like I'm a commercial for wow. me. Wow. How much are we paying those guys? Yeah, like three, 4000 a piece. Per event. Per event. So I'm going to drop, you know, but I had the whole card. Oh, my god! So it's on DVDs. It's so on everything. about 30 grand, 40 grand for the whole card. Right? Yeah, for hours of advertising. It was a total sleeper. And so you got to realize, like, Dana White came in and was like, who the F is Muscle Farm and why aren't they paying us? And, and then so he then changed it, everything around for everyone. And then right? it became more of like, okay, now you have to pay. You have to pay to play, uh, which is okay because we we were we were building. So it's like, look, the key in that, and what I learned by building that brand that way, is that now that I'm building my new brand, like it it was weird at first because it's like I was so invested in this for eight years, and it was so good. Yeah, I had a, it was really challenging to build to build something different, but it, it's it's been just as fun. And wow, so as man. you know, like, look, things happen, you change, and you evolve, and it's like. Now I'm like, we talked about my grandfather. I'm like, what, what can I build something to kind of commemorate like my great granddad? Like he didn't get to see any of this, like, cause he died so young. He even didn't get to see his own son lift weights and prosper and do whatever. So it's like, I went to that 1920s, 30s, hard work. Like, how can I create a brand? My new supplement company is called Max Effort Muscle. Like, how could I create something that's meaningful to me that represents really any hard work? It's mm-hmm. like, you know. And so I've got I've got a really cool thing going now, and it's it's it, cool. it, it's, it, it's real true to me. That's cool, man. What is it about lifting that you feel has served you, and why should everyone focus on lifting over other types of working out? So I will tell you that Benefits. my grandfather um, said something to my uh, Frank Boone. He's awesome. He said, you need to start lifting weights, Corey. It's going to help you with your sports. It's going to help you with confidence. And he goes, and the plus is the girls like it. Mm-hmm. So I'm in at 12, sure, right? Sure. So um, my mom, when my dad left when I was about 11 years old, we lived with my grandparents for like a short period of time. And this is the exact time. And this is when he would come home from construction working. He was a coal miner for a long, a long time, but he was also a construction guy. And we go right down the basement and lift weights. I fell in love instantly. Yeah. One, because it was something I could do with him. Uh-huh. We we golfed and we lift weights. That's what we've done still to this day. Uh-huh. And it's like, and I saw some shoulders popping out, some things, and I just fell in love with it, man, because I, I just felt it. And that's why I tell people, like, confidence is everything. That's it. 
lack of self-confidence. Belief in yourself. Oh, it's, it's amazing. So I, I can't stress enough, like, you don't have to go and do what I did. You don't have to diet and do all this. But, like, taking that time for yourself to building you, man, it's, it's, it's amazing. And so, like, I fell in love with it, and I was just like, I couldn't get enough. And then, you know, the internet really wasn't around for the most part. So I'm just reading everything Arnold wrote, all every magazine I could put my face in. Like, that's mm. all I was into. And just the amount that I just, like, the confidence of being in front of people or being on athletic fields, like, and he didn't even really know everything, what he was doing. Like, he's just, we're doing curls, reverse curls, right. calf raises, you know. He was lifting weights. He basic stuff. Up, yeah. But just being able to share that with him and then, like, for him to experience what I've accomplished from it, because he's 90, he's seen mm. it all. Yeah. Like, you know, he's met Arnold several times. Right. And, like, the second time you met Arnold, he remember, Arnold remembers his name because that's he knows how important he is to me. Wow. And so it's, like, for him to think, like, I got this 12 year old kid in my basement and now I'm at this event in Columbus and Arnold still remembers mine. Like he was like mind blown and, mm. you know, come to see the gym. It's, it feels real good, man. It's cool. That's cool, man. Why do you think, um, besides confidence, do you feel like everyone should be lifting or should you feel like they should do any type of movement and working yeah, out? I think it's whatever your jam is. So it doesn't have to be lifting. No. You just feel like this is what helps you. That's build confidence. Yeah. That's what you love. I'm a thousand percent a weightlifter. I'm not a runner. Yeah. Some people get it, the same thing from running. So I don't care whether it's yeah. handball, right. whether it's lifting, whether it's running. Activity on a day-to-day basis is one of the most therapeutic things mm-hmm. ever. Now, we'll tell you about lifting is lifting doesn't care who you are, what you've done. It wants the, the, the iron doesn't care. So I go in that morning and if I'm not giving it, like it pushes it back against you. You know how it is. And, and to me, it's like I'm piling all this. You know, I've been squatting every day for over like a thousand days. I pile that weight on my back every day. And like, you got to get up. Mm. What's the what's the thing? You give up, fall over. I mean, it's like to me, it's just, it's a personal battle every day. And we train at 4 a.m. like we talked about. And like, I feel like if I can get through that, dude, I'm walking out of the gym at 530. Then I'll go and lunge. <laughs> then I go and lunge a half hour um, and listen to the podcast and do all that. So I lunge 40, you know, 400, 800 meters on about five days a week. That's my cardio. That's my conditioning. Just air, no weights. Straight walking. Uh, sometimes I wear a vest. It just depends on You'll how far. you lunge I'm, just on a field. Like around a track. No way. So I'll do, I've done a mile with 80. Uh, I did a mile with a 40 pound vest and three quarters of a mile with an 80 pound vest. Why? After you lift. After you'll I lift. lunge. That's like my cardio. Dude, so I call it lunge and learn. How do you even just... My legs are crazy, bro. <laughs> you must be so well, strong. What happens is is it creates like really strong connective tissue. Because I do powerlifting too. You know, my best squat is... Uh, what a, I did 540 at 181 in a meet. Mm. And so it, that connective tissue gets really strong from all that conditioning. Mm. And so, you know, whether you're clean in front squatting, whatever, or if you're run, like I don't run that often, but when I have to, all that stuff's like real secure just because I train it all the time. Your knees aren't loose. Your knees aren't stressed out. No. I feel, wow, yeah, so that's, so for me, like by seven or six 30, I'm done with all that. I've already, so I, here's my, my daily strategy is simple, man. I get up at three and as soon as I hit the car, like is was about three twenty to drive to the gym is about 30, 40 minutes from my house. I'm listening to you or ET mm-hmm. or my podcast, whatever I'm doing personal development. I hit the gym hour and a half in it out. More podcasts, more audio books at the track. Cardio, while you're doing yeah. cardio. Yeah, and then uh, driving. So I'm I'm about an hour and a half in working out. Wow. And an hour and a half in development and ain't even seven. Mm. So I tell people, like, if me and you're in the same business, you better be real efficient. Yeah. Because so I'm down with the day when people are waking up. You got it. Wow, man. So what time do you go to bed? Nine, ten? Mm, like 10.30. Yeah. Try to operate on about five. How do you do that, man? I, Here's what I think. I think it's because, honestly, my supplements, my diet – and everything's so dialed in. I don't want to say, you, again, I'm not breaking world records. Right. So maybe if I was trying to or trying to make an Olympic team or something, would six, I would need a little seven, bit more. Eight. Yeah. But I think I can cheat the system a little. Wow, man. And I'm still competing multiple times a year. So, I mean, still doing shoots, still doing multiple powerlifting meets. And so. you used to be, I think I saw photos in here where you were pretty overweight at one point, right? Yeah. So one time, uh, like 2010, I made it up to 240. Wow, man. Just because I was all West Side barbell, straight up powerlifting, sure, and sure. I bought in, right? The funny thing is I did bigger weights at 181 once I actually realized what I was doing. Really? It's way stronger now, yeah. One of then the things, at 240. Then at 240. Why is that? Uh, I think that I just, uh, you know, I don't know. I think that I just learned more. I mean, I thought the weight would move the weight, and mm. in some cases it does. Now, yeah. if I weigh 240 right now with what I know, I'd probably be way stronger. Yeah. But, like, I know that um, it's more optimal for me to be under 200 pounds mm. marketing-wise and sure, just for sure. me. And, like, one of the coolest things I've, I've tried to do performance-wise, I just did in April. I did an Olympic lifting meet on Friday, a bodybuilding show on Saturday, and a powerlifting meet on Sunday in the same weekend. I call it the muscle trifecta, and I don't know anybody's ever done it before. Right. So to, in, cool. in my industry, to find something no one's done is pretty tricky. 
And it was hard, but it was like, it was really cool. And I was the most nervous for Olympic lifting because I had never landed a snatch really on a platform in yeah. front of anybody before. Yeah. Um, I was the most surprised when I woke up the next day, I looked pretty good. I got second in the bodybuilding show, which I was happy about. Nice. I almost won the overall. It was a drug-free show, tested. And then the next day I woke up for powerlifting and I squatted five bills at 178, deadlifted 500, still benched 315 on a pause. So I was like, 80 pounds within my total Pretty if, amazing if i just did it with that by itself so it was a really neat weekend that's really i'm always cool, trying to man. push myself i hear you man what um <clears throat> tell me about the deals you've done with muscle farm with mm -hmm. arnold with tiger sure. with everyone else you've you've had some of the biggest athletes absolutely who came on you know this was the first brand, supplement brand that Arnold ever associated his name with. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Besides so, Joe Weider, like in the early sure, days. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. And then Tiger, I don't know if he'd done a supplement brand before then. Mm. Uh, we were talking before the show about, you know, some of these stories. You just hung out with Arnold this morning and yeah. went out with him and had breakfast. That was awesome. But how do these deals go down and why did they work with you and why did they yeah. work with Muscle Farm and how did you get a hold of them? Just sure, sure. So that. the Arnold story is great. So I definitely want to share that. Sure. Um, so we were literally, uh, I believe in Arizona golfing with one of our investors at muscle farm. And he says, Hey, you guys know my, uh, uh, sister's married to Tom Arnold, the actor. Uh -huh. He goes, do you, he goes, would you be interested in working with Arnold? And we're all like, uh, yeah. He's like, well, let me call Tom real quick. So he calls Tom Arnold and I've helped Tom with some weight loss and stuff since then. Like he's awesome. And so he calls Tom and he's like, yeah, I'll talk to Arnold. We'll see, let him do some research and we'll see. Literally, it was just Tom Arnold knew Arnold Schwarzenegger because they did like True Lies and all that yes, stuff. They've true. been homies forever. Yeah, and so Tom, Tom, so Tom Arnold connected connected us with Arnold, and Arnold's team did some research and they said it. They're like, go to Cali, Santa Monica, right down the road, and do a there, meeting. There's your shot. Wow. So I'll be honest with you, like. I've been waiting for this my whole life, dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, You're I was ready. Now, what I had done- 29, 30 years, or how old are you at this time? 35 or- Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, about four four years ago, maybe? About 35. So about right? 35. So yeah. I'm like, and what I had done anyway- And you've been to the Arnold Classic probably 20 absolutely. years. You've I sold programs at the Arnold Classic when I was 20. <laughs> you've seen him there all the time. A it's million like, times. Yeah, yeah. You know, and ever always wanted to be in this position. Sure. And not only that, I had about a year earlier started really working on trying to write for his website- and so yes. this actually, I'll backtrack a second Sports because, yeah. so I started, so Arnold had featured one of my articles the year previous to that. And this is what gets kind of interesting. Like I was banging on Daniel Ketchel. He's the one who runs everything like catch, put me on the site, put me on the site. He's like, all right, Dan's right. assistant, right? Yeah. yeah Dan's yeah. awesome. So yep. what up catch? So I would say, I said, he said, send me an article. Finally, he was like, I barraged him, send me an article. And I wrote an article called golden era intensity that talks about how intense they were compared to now and why mm. people can learn from it. Yeah. So it was a really like you, I, you have to know what you're talking about to write an article, I guess. Um, you got to understand that the era of training. Sure. So I knew article, I didn't know Arnold read every article on his website, but he mm. does. Mm. And so basically he read my article and at the Arnold classic, um, I was at my booth and Patrick shows up. Now I had never met Patrick, his son, his son but he had a security guard with him. I had no clue who he was. And muscle so farm booth, muscle farm booth. Yep. And so this is uh, about, Two, about a year and a half previous to the meeting and then I'll, I'll fast forward there and so he comes over and he says hey um is Corey here I'm like yeah it's me I'm like like what, what do you up? need <laughs> yeah and he goes my dad told me to come over he read your article he really liked it and I go who's your dad he goes uh Arnold I'm like oh shit okay <laughs> you know what I, mean? like, I had no clue so we started talking he goes yeah he read it on the plane he's like he said he'll come over tomorrow he wants to talk to you about no it no way so I'm like looking at my home he's like all right sweet yeah and so that kind of set the groundwork for when I did walk in his yeah, office. Yeah. He already knew, I knew what was going on. So he came over and said hi for like 20 yeah, seconds. Yeah, 20 seconds. Yeah. We took a picture. We talked a little bit. And it was just like, he knows who I am now. Yeah. And that it's not that's easy big. to get done. That's big. Yeah, that's big. For a guy that has one one word uh, name. You yeah. know, there's Madonna, there's Arnold, there's yeah. a certain Stink. people. Yeah, Usher. there's only certain <laughs> people like this, right? And so, you know, fast forward, when I'm walking in the office, I already know Ketchell. Well, not well, but well enough. Arnold already knows I understand him. And then now it's like the business is already doing 70 million. Th those guys can do all the numbers. But I knew like, and the same with you, I'm sure, like emotionally, I, he needed to connect with somebody to feel good about. Dude, it's his likeness. Yeah, yeah. It's Arnold. He's the goat of the industry. Mm -hmm. So I walked in there and, and it was so funny because his office is super intimidating. Mm -hmm. Every bodybuilding trophy he's ever won. All these movie, movie posters. Photos, yeah. Oh, it's unbelievable, right? <laughs> So we're there and he walks in and, you know, it's kind of, it's just craziness that it's even happening. And he sits down and he goes, 
okay, guys, I got, you know, I got this movie. I'm going to pop 20 million on. I've got this going on. He's like, so why do I want to do this? And then he just shuts up and sits back. But no one says anything. And I'm thinking, this is my shot. Like, I'm going to get it, right? So I said, Arnold, here's the deal. Kids don't know how to superset any. I'll go right to the training because that's what I know he likes. Kids don't know how to superset anymore. Their intensity sucks. Like, I need you to help me bring that back. I'm going to come in here. I want to pull all the old footage from the 70s. I want to get you on interview. I want to write plans. I want to do all these things. And we're going to tell people how to train their ass off and then how to eat. And then they food supplement. Arnold always calls it food supplement because that's what they called it back in the day. Like, then it's like, you're not going to take this pill and become a champion. Mm -hmm. I'm going to teach you the intensity that you're missing that has been just, people are just curling and working on their cell phone. He yeah. hates it too. Yeah. And so he was like in. And what's interesting is at that time, I was on bodybuilding.com with a really popular training program called the Get Swole, which I just saw the numbers the other day. It's on about 24 million views at this point. Amazing. It's like about four years old. And so I was like, hey, here's a here's an intro video of what I just did. And he took my laptop and he watched the whole, I like went to grab it after like 30 seconds and he like gave me the hand, like sit down. So I sat down, he watched it and he was like, all right. Like I could tell he's like working in his head, right? But this was the, the turning point, what I thought. There was an investor that had bought, I was on the cover of Fitness RX that month with my kids. It had never been done before that I'm aware of. And it was at the airport. So the guy buys the cover and I didn't, I've, I don't know why I didn't think to bring it, Lewis, but right. this guy did, luckily. He, luckily. he throws it to Arnold at the exact <clears throat> point. So it comes across Arnold's desk and he, and he goes, he looks at it and he goes, well, this is really cool. I'm like, yeah, man, that's my three kids, you know, Alex, Madeline, and Andon. And he's like, instantly throws his glasses on. He starts looking through it. And then it's at my gym which looks like the gym he trained at. Right. Dude, it's 12 page spread, pull out ad poster. I mean, mm. it's it's decked out. And so perfect he, timing. Unbelievable timing. <laughs> and I remember and, and this is kind of like a takeaway, I think. I remember how hard that prep was, and I don't know yeah. why, yeah. but that specific shoot was really hard for me. And I remember every day I got through it. I was like getting through it, getting through it, and I killed it, Lewis. Mm. I mean, I killed the shoot. And how did I know that Arnold Schwarzenegger sitting as far away from me mm. would be looking at it going, and he goes, yeah, man, your abs kind of remind me of Frank Zane's and this and that. And like, where's this gym at? I need to come visit it sometime. And I'm like mind blown at this point. Like, but I knew he knew that I would know what to do with him and that I would keep you could care trust of it. your brand. Yes. And, yeah. and so I really believe that the numbers made sense. The distribution was there, but I mean, I think I was his guy and, wow. and, and I still am, I think. Yeah, he kind of reconfirmed that this morning at breakfast. Sure, sure. Like it was, it was really cool. Why had he never done a supplement deal before? With his never family? felt that way about anybody. Really? Yeah, I really wow. believe that. I think that. Um, look, they always say that what rec real recognizes real. Like I'm not no movie star, dude, but I'm a lifter. I'm not even that big of a guy. I was a six guy on my basketball team, but I'm a grinder. I'm a lifter, and I love it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, and I know it. I mean, it's what I do. It's what I've done my whole life. Yeah, yeah. And I was waiting for that moment. And, and I always tell people when I speak in public, there's no way I would walk out of the meeting and not have him be my business partner. If I would lose that, I would, I would regret it the rest of my life. Mm. Like there was not another option. Like I walk in there, when I walk out, Arnold's going to sign the dotted line because of me, whoever, but I'm going to make it happen. I'm not letting it like, and it, there was, I don't want to get a twist that the other guys did their, their role on. Right, right. We're selling this much. The we're doing that. Don't get me wrong. Like it wasn't the numbers just me. Needed to make sense. Absolutely. And they did. But like I know the personal touch, I feel like made a huge difference, mm. and man, it was awesome. What if you just said no? Yeah, there was. I just don't think he would have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really, I had my mind. I wasn't even. It was yeah, yeah. an eerie calm for me. Yeah, sure. I was like, you just I had was, a feeling it's gonna, it's gonna work. Because Timing, I, everything. I just knew if, and, and so many times I thought about it, if I got a chance to tell Arnold what I could tell him, I think you, mm. I think he'd be my homie. That's cool. And he became my homie. Like I saw him in the gym today. He's like, oh, let's go do breakfast. Let's catch up. Yeah. Let's do this. You know, we're pumping out some arms. And it was just, Amazing. it's just organic. It's just, I mean, we, we're for real Amazing. friends. Yeah. And do you feel like, you know, and then you, you landed Tiger and a few other people, I think. Um, do you feel like having these bigger celebrities as well as the UFC brand yeah. helps you sell more products? Yeah. And talk to me about so that. So I'll tell you what. No. And should people be looking for celebrity, you know, partners? No, and yes, them? I think it gives you the awareness. But if you don't have the support, you're not going to sell more product. So what happened was we had this big, overwhelming awareness. But then once the people got aware of you, what do you what do you do with them? It's a it's mm -hmm. a funnel, right? Like yeah. they get you get in your funnel essentially. Yeah. But it's like then it was the support of the workouts, support of the diet, support of the customer service. Like that's the same thing I do now. Like you know, we have a couple celebrities that are, that are working on the new line. 
they might shed some light on it. Or essentially I'm a niche kind of like social media guy. So it's like, people are like, Oh, what's Corey doing now? Oh, great. Oh man. There's content daily. He answers how to use the product. Like it's an experience. Mm, yeah. And so I think that no matter how big we got, it was still that experience that I that I think made a difference, man. Mm-hmm. At least that's what I believe. It doesn't matter how many celebrities you have on there. If the if you're customer experience sucks, yeah, the product sucks. It doesn't matter. Doesn't You'll get matter. short-term sales, but I was building a foundation and still am for long-term growth in a business. Mm-hmm. That was key. You've got these uh, these principles in the mindset manual. Sure. That talk about how to really optimize your life. I love the cover. It's kind of like a magazine cover. Make sure yeah. you guys check this out. Where can they get this book? Uh, ActivateMedia.com. ActivateMedia.com. Yep. We'll have it all linked up here on the show notes. Um, but why why this? Why do you think mindset is so important in achieving results fitness sure. wise, business wise? Like why these principles? So I think that a lot of people get lost in a couple of things. I think it's they really don't know what they want to do with themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think they have no strategy daily. And yes. I think what I wanted to show with this book, especially Lewis, was here's a principle that I found through business, through reading, through life. Here's how I really applied it to myself. Here's a personal story of why it worked. Mm. Like I talk about the Arnold story in there, yep. like seize the day, like, mm-hmm. you know, how I did it, like standing in line. Like it's funny because he had a best selling book. I waited in line for four hours to yep. get it signed. I was doing 70 million in sales, Lewis. I got the, there's the photo right yeah. here. Yeah. I had 10 seconds of his time. You know what I said to him right there? <laughs> yes. I come up. He's not even looking. He's signing right. books. I said, Mr. Schwarzenegger, um, I'll do 70 million in sales this year. I'm a vendor at the Arnold Classic. I just want to say hello. And he goes, that was the first then right. came the article then came so it's like yes. over time i'm like this the dude points. will know me yes like no question and he said like something for a moment then and then and, yeah and, then on to and that's on yeah, but yeah. that was the first point yeah and then it became the article then it became the meeting and it's like i was priming myself yeah. for that years of hard work yes it didn't just happen the first meeting no. you weren't like i'm gonna pitch him this product no you can't at it'd be a like book signing it'd be like get out of here no so that, that was, that's part of what I explain in there, mm-hmm. right? And then when it is time, you don't pee down your leg. Right. You got to be ready and prepared. Give me the ball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here's the thing that I think a lot of people make the mistake of. I mean, I'm sure you get this a lot too. Whenever I'm at an event speaking or signing books or whatever, mm-hmm. people try to take me away and say like, oh, can you look at this idea of mine? Can you invest in my idea? And it's like, yeah. I literally just met you for a moment. Yeah, you can. Like, you don't have the respect for the other that's people That's amateur to me. And... You just make you put me in a weird position. Yeah. Like, what am I supposed to say? You like, got to create a relationship first. You got to add value. Yes. And you added value by like, let me write on this site for free. I'm sure yeah. you weren't getting paid. No, me, of course not. Let me promote it as hard as I can. Yep. Let me, you know. Anything I could do. Anything you could do. I just needed that little. And, and when I, when, here's the thing I love about Arnold. Yeah. Like when we launched the line at Muscle Beach, which I'm doing a shoot there Thursday, I'm pumped about. And he goes, he calls on Tuesday and says, let's launch it Friday. Now there's permits. There's all there's a bunch of stuff to launch the you know he's just like and get it done. Make it happen. Like that's that's this how is my he is. time frame, make it happen. Well, and he just he tests you like that. Just like yeah. this morning, you know, I ran into him and he's like, be here, here, and here, and he just jumps on his bike. Yeah. And I like had no ride. Like I'm had, I'm I'm looking for an Uber, a What's cab. The address? Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, but that's how he does things. And he's like, if you continue to deliver, I keep giving you more. Yeah, exactly. And that's just how that's how he is. But I love that about him, and I've learned that with the guys that I I mentor, I do the same thing. Guys will you know tweet me, hey Corey, I want to work out with you. Four a.m. You know the gym yeah, address. Look morning. it up. Yeah, yeah. I don't care if you live in Alabama. Drive up. Yeah. I mean, I just, I'm the same way. I learned that from him. Do guys ever show up for him? All the time. Yeah. Like every week. High school, week. college kids. Are showing All over up. the place, yeah. But how many stay, you know, I could continue going? So what's interesting about our crew, and, and shout out to all the guys at Old School 4AM, most of them drive more than 45 minutes a day to be there. Mm. Just one way. One guy drives an hour and 15 minutes. Because they know Committed, man. there's something different going on there. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, like we're chatting and stuff about, but we're, we're working most of the time. But like, what I love is a guy will come and show up for six months and then say, Corey, can I get 15 minutes of your time to help me with my business? Of course I'm going to give you that time because mm-hmm. you didn't show me you can be here at 4 a.m. You worked like, hard the whole time. Absolutely. So, but if you ask me in the first one, like some dude will come in for one workout and ask for my, ask for my phone number like I'm a chick or something. I'm right. like, uh, no. Yeah. Keep tweeting me, homie. Like, I'm not going to do that, but if you show up I'm for three for months, months. Yeah, yeah. yeah, then yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll help break down your whole business. We'll, we'll have breakfast together after one of these times. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and so I'm, I'm the same way. Like, you got to earn it a little bit. I yeah, mean, yeah. that's... 
So, I mean, relationship building is what I think I'm one of the best at. Yeah. That's why I'm where I'm at. I mean, look, me and you have known each other for a year. When I set, when I right. first saw you, I didn't go, dude, I got to be on your podcast. I would love right. to be on your podcast. Don't get sure. me wrong, but I, we, we had lunch. We got to talk. We've texted multiple times, and yeah. now it makes sense. Of course. So, but if I went in for the kill right out the gate, that doesn't, you're like, this dude just wants to be on my podcast. Right, 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 like, right. you know, so yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. how you got to operate, man. So if you guys can, that's a big takeaway, mm-hmm. I think. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, why is that so important? So I got a great story for this. I got to tell you. So I came to West Hollywood, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, It's 2000, man, I think 2003 or four. I was, once again, all over this magazine to shoot me, all over them. Finally, they were like, they booked me. You were you were reaching out to them and saying reaching you need out to, to them. You need to have me on the you cover. You need to have me on the cover. I mean, every for how long? A year or something? Or? Probably one to two years. Every Arnold Classic, they had a booth. I'm just all over them. It was here's phys- why. Here's what you're going to get out of it. All and things, I think right? they were just tired of me, so finally they <laughs> did it right. It was Physical Magazine, which is actually GNC's magazine at the mm-hmm. time. So they booked me, and it's around like they gave me really short notice, and I was actually in kind of powerlifting shape. So I busted my tail to get in shape in like a month, and it would have worked if I'd have known. I think a little bit better, but anyway, so. I fly here, I eat the wrong thing. When you get on a plane, a lot of people don't know this, but the cabin pressure can mess with your water retention. Mm. It'll take me like, uh, like I just flew here a couple of days ago. It takes me about 48 hours till I look dry again because yeah. your body just kind of messed up with that. So I get here and I ate the wrong thing before I got on the plane. I went tanning like a week, like uh, two days before that. So my skin was like red. So mm. it was holding water. Like I got here and like basically looked way different. It was the weirdest thing ever. So I got here and I was like, oh, I'm going to go do some cardio. So I tried to sweat it out like a wrestler. Well, it made me look even worse. By the time oh I got gosh. to the photo shoot, my worst nightmare happened. I had no cuts. Like, I was thinking I was living my dream, right? I'm flying to Cali. What do you mean you had no cuts? Like, I had no ass. Like, everything. I was soft as a marshmallow. Oh, you didn't have, you weren't, yeah! you weren't shredded. Like, when I left, I looked oh pretty, gosh. I looked okay. I like, not like I do now, but I looked good enough to probably pull it off. Dude, with three things, variables I did wrong when I got here and then cardio on top of it. Like, so I get to the photo shoot and Greg Plitt, who had passed away about a year ago, mm-hmm. And I, and I have the picture in the book, like he's there, he's killing it. 190 shredded. shredded. He's got always this girl, on. got this girl on his arm. Like it, cause we came in the industry about the same time. We just went kind of different paths. And so I walk in and I'm like, mind blown. This dude's like the best thing I've ever seen, like on a cover before. And I'm like looking down, like, what am I doing? And I'm already like a tweener, bro. Like, yeah, you know yeah. I mean? It just is what it is. And so like 11 <laughs> covers later, I'm glad I went through this, but, yeah, yeah. um, the guy like shoots me for like 20 minutes and I look at him and go, man, I know I'm just going to, I'm going to go home with my tail between my legs. I just quit the shoot. Wow. I gave, I took his card. I said, I'll come back to LA when I can represent myself properly. No way. And I said, will you shoot me again? And he said, yeah. And I'll, I'll submit him for you. So I went home. I worked out for like, I worked my ass off for like six months. I called him on my own dime, flew back out here, shot that a year later, my first cover, cover came out. Now I could have eased. I mean, Greg played, this is funny. He sat down before I went to shoot and he asked me not being, a, not being mean. He goes, Oh, so what part of like what part of the crew are you? No way, because he was. He just didn't know. Sure. He didn't know somebody was booked after, and I obviously didn't look like I was ready for a cover shoot. Wow. Dude, it was the most humbling wow. thing ever. But I, I was like, you know what? I know I can do this stuff. I know what I'm capable of, and I, and I, I wanted back to like thinking, grow rich type stuff. Like, I thought and and felt what it would feel like to go to Barnes and Nobles and pick that cover yeah. up. I wanted to hand that it to my me for years, man. I wanted to hand it to my grandpa and say, "Look, this is what you did for me." Like, boom. And I wasn't going to let anything stop me. And wow. so like I said, it never gets old, man. 11 covers later, like I love it. Yeah. And I'm getting the one I mean, I'm shooting a couple more this year, you know, until they quit calling. I'm going to keep shooting them. Of course. 38, I'll just keep rolling. It's great, man. <laughs> and then when you hit 40, there'll be a whole new like Yeah, men's health. Yeah, exactly. I'm starting to do a little work with them too, so it's like, look, Literally, when I was 17 years old, I said I want to lift weights and get paid. Mm-hmm. At 38, I still want to lift weights and get paid. It just means something different now. Right, and you have different seasons of life, Absolutely. With different experiences. Yeah, and trying to balance. I mean, I haven't talked a lot, about, but being a dad on top of it, right? You know, and and trying to balance that is not the easy. That's part of the reason why I only sleep five hours. <laughs> you got three kids or four kids? Three. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, you're, it you're is. Machi- you're a machine. <laughs> I try. I love man. It. You're like Steve Weatherford. You guys are so positive and like train at the same time. Steve's and- awesome. You guys are machines, man. <laughs> Thanks, Lewis. <laughs> um, why do you think so many people, I get this a lot, people that sign up for my programs and listen to the podcast, they're afraid mm-hmm. to fail. Yeah. You say don't be afraid to fail. It's it's not that easy for a lot of people. Why do you feel like so many people are afraid? And how do you think they can switch a trigger in their mind that says, whatever I'm afraid to fail, that's what I need to do right now? Sure. Teachable moments. Like I think I've learned so much by messing up. And so like I think it was Jordan had that quote that says like, you know, I've shot the last shot X amount of times. You, I mean, you have to be like, 
I think Gary Vee says it really well too. Like he learns, he likes to lose sometimes because he learn he learns so much because he wins a lot, right? Yeah. And I and I've won a lot in my life. There's no doubt. But like, you know, I look at Muscle Farm. There's some wins. There's some losses. Well, when I build max effort muscle, I'm taking those losses and I'm fixing them. Yeah. So live and you learn. And it, people are spray, uh, afraid to be vulnerable because once you put yourself out there and if it doesn't work and you've told all your friends, like I told everybody I knew I was shooting the cover of that magazine. Yeah. Like. Every, I shot four covers that never came out before the first, like every time, finally I quit telling people cause I was just like, it just never worked out. So it's <laughs> like, you start to realize like, if you don't experience that, you can't grow. So yeah, you're going to fail, mm. but it's not a failure. It's only a failure if you quit. Like if I just quit, then that became a failure. It really wasn't. It was just a really a teachable moment that somebody, the universe says you ain't ready yet. Mm -hmm. And I always say like, I was at the height whenever I was selling Muscle Farm and still currently, if I would have had those opportunities earlier in my life, I don't I would have went on deaf ears. Right. I think that it all happened in the right time and still happening in the right time mm -hmm. because the perception of the way that I operate is true. You follow me, like you know I'm up at three, I'm going to bed at ten, I'm I'm competing, I'm doing I'm building businesses, I'm building these like you know, I operate like I want it to be as real as possible every day so people think they can do it because yeah. I am not gifted. Sure. Like I'm not a gifted athlete. I didn't, I, I wasn't even recruited by D3 schools, nothing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I want to play hard. Yeah. I'm a grinder, man. Yeah, That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like you have to be really efficient and you got to work your ass off to, to roll with me mm -hmm. because like, I mean, guys, I mean the volume we do in the workouts, the amount of development I do, like yeah, yeah. I just know I'm not really that special. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to make an, uh, unextraordinary, essentially, you know, athletic gift, extraordinary. Sure, sure. By working hard. Yeah. ET style. Exactly. When did you get married? Uh, uh, how old were you? Tw let's see. I've been married 13 years. Okay. So I'll be 30. So 23. 23. Yeah. That was huge. Rachel, but Rachel's known me the whole time. Yeah. She was literally helping me paint the first walls of the first gym. Mm. So Rachel, like, believe, even though, like, it's so funny because her family was like, her dad was an engineer. She was in school to be a teacher. Like, and I'm in here like, I want to be a model personal trainer. Like she took me <laughs> home. They're like, uh, Who is this crazy yeah, man? exactly. Right now, obviously over time I've proved so, so, you know, that I can, I can provide for my family, but Rachel believed every step of the way. Mm. And, and I'll tell you what, because you know, that crazy college life that I lived for maybe six months, like once I met her, it all stopped. And that's mm. the same time I started really building my business too. And she's been so supportive the whole way. And I, I there's no way I could have done it without her. That's why I write the first the first passage in the book is all about like, you know, meeting her and she, she mm. changed my life for sure. So you don't think you would have been able to build the business or have no way the health that you have without that relationship? No. And especially building a family. Like she right. knew what she would always say. Like she helps the balance. You're going to be out of balance at times when you're building a business, you know that Lewis, mm -hmm. but like she helps check me sometimes. Like yeah. it's funny cause I'm doing this photo shoot and I was like, you know, I think I'm going to come home and do a bodybuilding show. She's like, Corey, you already did one bodybuilding show. <laughs> like, just come home yeah, and like, yeah. let's eat ice cream on Fridays again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, I need that because I always think if I work, I work, I work, then I'm providing better for my kids. Well, they just want my time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I can give it to them because I have that ability. I've created that for myself. So it's like that balance. Like I always think it's not enough. One more tweet, one more thing. And so that's tricky. Sometimes you got to cut it off. Yeah, you got to. And so she helps me a ton with that. And she's just always believed in me. And she's real. Like she, she'll, she'll set like, she's like, Corey, you got all these people online hyping your head up. You don't need me to do that too. Right. So she's real. Like she'll be like, Hey, you didn't bring it today. Like, so it's good. I mm -hmm. used to kind of, I don't want to say I disliked it at first because you know, it's fun to have yes people. Yeah. yeah. But when your girl's like, Hey, but she also support, I woke up and said, today's the day I'm done. I'm going to ask for my severance package. Like I'm, I'm ready to be done. I'm walking away from the salary. I don't care. I'll build something else. I'll build Corey G fitness.com build it. I'll build a marketing company with John Fosco, my partner. Like, you know, I was like, I'm done. And she didn't even question it. She goes, man, we've been doing this 18 years. Like if you're done, then you're done. And it right. doesn't feel right to you anymore. I would have been, I feel like I would have been living a lie as an entrepreneur if I'm staying mm. for a paycheck. Yeah, of course. That's it. Wow. And so it was, it was powerful though. How, and, and very yeah, like, yeah. it just felt like a weight off my shoulders. To, How has the relationship evolved, you know, starting from, from scratch with nothing Yeah. to, okay, building and building to having children to, all the different avenues you've gone through, starting companies, getting out of companies. Mm -hmm. How has that evolved? Um, I guess your relationship. I mean, with her, yeah. Um, because and, it, and with all the kind of the fame or the credibility or sure. the success that comes, 
You know, has that been challenging in any way? Um, here's what I'll tell you. Like a lot of people are like, oh, you're in a fitness. There's probably so many girls and this mm-hmm. and that. And because I've, I've been so happy with her, uh-huh. like really, I've never projected myself as looking for any other partner. Right. Like I, I don't even wear, actually, she don't even care. I don't even wear a wedding ring just because I don't like jewelry really. Right. Like in, doesn't matter because I'm not but looking you're for wearing it. bars too. You're yeah, exactly. And it, that's where I start. Why I didn't wear it initially is because I was in the gym all the time yeah, yeah. when I was personal training, but like, I'm not looking for it, man, because it, I found the person I wanted to be with. Mm-hmm. And I, the funny thing is when I met her when I was 20 and I thought to myself, like, I knew she was the right one. So I had to make a decision. All you 20 year old uh, out there, this, this could happen <laughs> to you like, okay, do I go be a crazy guy for a little while longer and then come back to her? But she might not be there. Uh-huh. I just made the decision like, this is my girl. I know it. I just wow. knew it plain and simple. And dude, she's been amazing. And then she's, I mean, she got her master's in education. So, I mean, she stays at home with the kids now. She helps me with my businesses online to keep track. Cause that's the one thing I would tell you, like, I'm really good at creating. Um, I, I'm not really good at keeping track of everything. Like she, yeah. you know, she's better with the numbers and, and my partner, John's really good with operations and the other business. So like, I'm good at creating, I'm good at the interaction. I'm good at yeah, like yeah. the overall creative part of it. Yeah. But when it comes to like, percentages and numbers and forecasting that's not really my jam mm-hmm. and it yeah. never it never has been yeah. so i'm not gonna like I, at this point i'm not even trying to get better at it i just need sure, help sure, you, sure. i need help <laughs> sure, 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 yeah you got to know what you're good at of course man so but she's been i, I can't say enough she's been, it's cool. been it's been amazing but i think the realness of it'd been different if she'd have came in when i already was at muscle farm mm-hmm. because she believed the whole time the gym the personal training vision like i used to practice on her and her her roommates, like my first personal training clients wow. and literally been there the entire way. That's great. It's, it, you know, it's real. That's she cool. likes me for me That's great, and my man. craziness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Amazing. Cool. Um, what's something you're proud of that most people don't know about? Um, that's a good question. Now you're going to come into the really good questions. I would say <laughs> that most people don't know a lot about me as a dad probably. Mm. And so I think it's like as busy as I am, my kids know the narrative that we're changing, like from how I grew up to how they're growing up. Mm-hmm. My son's read the book. He's 11. So like that was probably one of the coolest things. Like he was able to ask me questions. Like I could have never like articulated this yeah. in just person. Dad, I didn't know that about you. Dad, I didn't know. Oh, that's awesome. About our, like it was so cool. It's probably the coolest experience of that. Him and my mom, and my grandpa, those three reading it was unbelievable. And yeah. so I think like every night when they go to bed, they know I tell them I love them. And that um, I'll do anything for them. And we want to continue to grow, to evolve. So it's what I do now is important for them, but it's about their kids and their kids. Like I'm preaching generation stuff because I want it to be passed down the way that I operate, the principles. Like, dude, I'm a huge fan of Andrew Carnegie. So I've read Carnegie stuff for years and years. And so I want that like to be what we do. Mm-hmm. And so I think that they, they know I love them. They know I work hard. I'll do anything for them. I don't miss games. I don't miss like yeah. I'm there. Right. And it's like, but also I expect a lot. Like if you mess up in my house and you're 11, like the other ones haven't got to cause they're still young. We run sprints Wow. and I'm on it like a 1970s football coach. <laughs> like if you don't give it to me, like you yeah. run another one. Yeah. And I'm out there like my kid will not be soft. Wow. Like that's. That's real because like I didn't do all this to them for the next generation to screw it up. Mm-hmm. And, and they're want, not going to be a coal miner. They're going to still they're train gonna, like one. They, here's the thing is I don't want them to experience that. I'd never change. I tell my mom when I wrote this book, Ma, don't ever be sorry for what happened to us because I wouldn't be me if it wasn't. But mm-hmm. I need to instill that next generation that they're not super soft. Now, whether they want to be an entrepreneur, a teacher, whatever, I'm going to support them. But like there's a certain thing like effort is a choice. And so if I see you dogging a ground ball or doing this and yes. I tell you once Simmons. and you don't do it again, we're running. Yeah. And, and I'm real about that. I like it, man. Because effort is a choice. That's true. Dude. <laughs> That's true, man. It doesn't matter how old you are. A, I'll always pick the guy who gives more effort than anyone else. Every time. I don't care if they're the least talented. They got a little bit of talent. Yeah. And they, they effort is more than anyone else. Like, I'll have them on the so, team. So I'm preaching that because I think yeah. that can – that can that can help a lot of things if you understand that at a young age. Sure. And so like Alex plays soccer, baseball. Madeline's awesome at gymnastics. She's we're doing handstand contests after mm-hmm. dinner, and then my youngest and and he's a, he's a fireball. He's just getting in the sports. He's five. So it's like we we got a real good thing. Is it's healthy? It's active. Cool, it's it's really cool, That's man. Great, man. I feel super blessed. Congrats, man. Thanks. What are you most grateful for in your life recently? Um, recently, I would say. Um, What's been interesting, like, so Andon 
is back in school is in school for the first time. So he's five. Mm-hmm. So now there's actually during the day, like I can have coffee and, and I could have done this before, but I'm like the way I operate. I try to be really like when work starts, like I'm in it, like I can have coffee with my wife at 9 a.m. And she doesn't have anywhere to be mm-hmm. like I can be wherever I want to be nice. They're in school and we can just have time to us again. And so that's just happened recently because school just started. I'm really grateful for that. That and honestly, my grandparents are still alive. Like they're both 90. They've been able to see all this stuff. And um, lastly, that my mom is my customer service lady. Like she runs the website, CoreyGFitness.com. She's my customer mm-hmm. service. This is the highest, like like I said, she grinded for years. She makes more at CoreyGFitness.com than she did <laughs> in uh, all the jobs that she had done before. Now she had remarried and my stepdad, the one that got me the job, they, they do very well. So it's not like yeah. she's still struggling. But to be able to be like, mom, I'm about to hire somebody to take care of customer service. If you can learn how to do these little programs, like just answer people, you know, change their debit cards, whatever. And just, I know that you'll have my best interests. I would rather pay you. And she was like, well, I'll come up and you could teach me and dude, she's killing it. Wow. Like 11 o'clock on cares. Sunday cares. Yeah. Cause she got my back. She has to be in there in my accounts and you know, I need to have somebody I can trust yeah, yeah. and like giving her a raise, giving her a bonus. Like it's awesome. And the other day I asked her, I'm like, ma, when you worked at the furniture store or like, how much did you make a week? And she told him like, is this the highest paying job? You've-? Like, I didn't even know. Mm-hmm. She's like, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And I work at home and I work with you. I can talk to you more. Yeah, yeah. And it, I'm real thankful for all three of those things. That's cool. My mom works with me as well. So, so cool, right? It's pretty fun. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's actually, the re- it's been really rewarding, man. Mm-hmm. That's so, great, man. So I think re- time with Rachel, my mom, and then my grandparents still being alive are both things I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for every day. That's cool. Um, this is called the three truths question. Uh-oh. So it's your last day. Sure. And everything's been erased. Your books are deleted and programs, and it's all gone for some reason. Sure. But everyone's there. It's a celebration, and they ask you to write down your three truths, the three sure. things you know to be true about life or your experiences that you would pass on to everyone else, and it's the only thing they would have to live by. To remember me by or to live by. Like your principles, your three truths that yeah. you know to be true. They can't read the book anymore. I'm nervous. I've been trying to get ready for this one. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say are your three truths? Um, I think I thought about this a little bit because obviously I listen to your podcast, mm-hmm. getting ready. Um, don't settle. Because I think regret is probably one of the worst things that you can die with. And so for me, I could have stayed in that coal mine. Mm-hmm. I could have... Um, by my standards of what I wanted for myself, lived a mediocre life to some degree in a bunch of different dead end jobs and never lived my passion. Like I refused to settle. Even when I was at muscle farm, like it had changed and I was not going to settle. It doesn't matter how big it was. So like, I think like if you're somebody right now that's doing something you don't want to do, don't give in. So I would tell like my family, if they're reading these, do not settle just for that. Cause what do you do? You do it for 30 years and then you retire. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just to me like it, and it's going to be scary. I get it. And it takes time. I, I always say my rap album didn't go platinum overnight. I've been doing this 18 years, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but at some points it doesn't even feel like work at all mm-hmm. because I love what I do. And it's, it's changed a little bit over time, but man, the not settling has driven me forever. And I think that's extremely important. I think second would be have a true daily strategy. Because if you aimlessly just wander through life and you don't have a passion or purpose locked in, like I realized early that my passion was fitness. That was my way out, you know, and the purpose was to change generations. So it's way bigger than me. Mm-hmm. And so I think when things become way bigger than you, you they don't get old because it was about, it wasn't about me, it's about my kids. It's about their kids. And so if I get up at 3, 4 a.m. and like, I'm tired. Like I'm trying to change like family history. It's not just about me. And so like the second one was like, I need a real strategy that's dialed in with those things on my heart every day. And so like, that's like means so much like Mm -hmm. get up at this time, do this, do that. And like, I just knew if I did that for a long period of time and I was locked into when I was tired, I'm doing this for them. I always say I wanted my grandkids to say grandpa was a G. (laughs) I mean, that's, and that's exactly what I want them to say. Like he set us up. He taught us these principles. Mm-hmm. He, he changed the, the generation's tree of blue collar and work 30 years. And it was more like, hey, we can go live our dream of what we want to do. There's always a solution. You know what I mean? And so I would say those are the two top ones. Thirdly, like 
I would say um, one thing I got to do better at is um, really take a deep breath and live in the moment. I think I'm so focused on what's next all the time. Like just to sit here on this podcast and go, wow, I'm on Lewis Howell's podcast right now. Like this is really cool to capture it right. And so I think that we have documentation with Instagram and Twitter and and you can go back through your feeds and see what Mm -hmm. you did. And I think it's it's like scrapbooking used to be, right, or whatever. So I would say like those three things – I would want my kids if they, if they never knew me right? that, that they would. And that's one thing I love about content. You know, we had a friend on Barbell Shrug, Chris Moore just passed away, right? So sad, man. So, so sad. sad. And I knew him from two episodes and multiple texts, but an amazing guy. So nice. Unbelievable, right? How old is he? Like 30 or something? 30 years. Yeah. 30, 33. So what I learned from that, there's always a takeaway oh, for me man. on everything, right? It's really sad. So is his kids will know him from content. Mm-hmm. And it honestly lit a fire under me. That's that's why I started talking to you again. Like I need I need to do as much as I can because you're not guaranteed tomorrow, dude. No way. So it's like the more that I can do this, if something does happen to me, my kids, they're going to continue to learn from me because at the end of the day, I want to teach them so they can do what they want to do. And so like if I feel like if those three truths were on that piece of paper, that they, they would be able to have a good, good start in life. I like those, man. Thanks, man. Um, <clears throat> make sure you guys get the mindset manual. I've got one question left for Corey, but you can check him out. Corey G fitness.com at Corey G fitness. I got to tell you about the, the new book real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Entrepreneur or entrepreneur. Mm. We'll drop on, um, iTunes and Amazon here in about a week. There you go. And it's a true crash course of whether you want this life. We talked about this off air. Yeah. Like it looks great. But do you want to go through what it takes? And each chapter I ask you at the end, okay, now you understand what I just taught you. Mm-hmm. You still want to keep going? Right. So it's going to be like a nine buck uh, book yeah. on audio book. It'll be cool. good for everybody. CoreGFitness.com to get that one too. Uh, that'll, I think it, we're going to have iTunes. It's going to be audio mostly only. So. But where can they get it? Can they learn more out of it? Yeah. Corey G Fitness, Activate Media, both cool. places. And uh, social here's handles. the thing. One of the things was don't settle, but it's – a challenging life if you want to really go after it sometimes. And it takes Absolutely. a certain type of individual who is yes. committed to the pain and the challenges that come There's some pain for too. many, many years. <laughs> so um, you get to make a decision. So it's Entrepreneur or Entrepreneur, is that what it's called? That's a new book, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we'll have this all linked to the show notes as well so everyone can go there and check it out. Uh, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Corey, for your incredible – persistency <laughs> for your commitment your dedication i don't know anyone else who's so dedicated to their routine than you I, thanks man i know steve is pretty dedicated steve's on there too <laughs> he's pretty dedicated but you were like at a like a i don't know an army sergeant or something like <laughs> every morning there's always a video of you at a certain time yep. working heavy doing heavy weights not just talking about it doing it yep and you live by the routine and the principles. You don't just think it's good to talk about. I mean, it's such an inspiration to see someone living it to the T the way you do cool, with the kids, with the healthy lifestyle, with the wife, yep. with the businesses, like everything that you're doing and you're uplifting people. It's really inspiring thanks, to see man. that you're making a difference in the world. So I appreciate and acknowledge that. Love it. Yeah, man. Uh, final question. What's your definition of greatness? So... It's funny because it's changed over time. Mm-hmm. Um, I always say like when I was at the personal training studio making six figures, driving a late 90s Mercedes, I thought uh, to me that was like success. And I knew that I was like, if I would have stopped there, I don't think anybody would have said I was great, but I, I kind of won mm-hmm. in my mind, right? Mm-hmm. So greatness to me is leaving your mark to such a degree that when I'm well, like, that's why I love writing books and doing these things is that like you have a mark on the industry that you were there, whatever that is for you. And so like Arnold is obviously ultimate greatness is the way mm-hmm. I look at him. And I'm trying to think like, can I impact enough people? Cause when I quit chasing money and started developing people, my life changed completely. And can I impact enough people in my niche and, and go beyond that niche too, to where people are like, I want to be like Corey when I get into Bill Phillips was great. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to be like Bill Phillips. Right. I want to be that next generational guy that the kid that's 20 years old wants to be like me and that I've displayed like what you just said, what it really took. It's not a phantom. I got the, the Bentley with the bottle of shit. Like, no, I'm deadlifting 500 pounds at three 30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's what got me there. Like I want them to know that you don't have to be the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, 
that I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth, that I didn't like, but I wanted it more than everybody else. And when there was a roadblock, I either climbed under the, I dug a hole under the wall. I went over it. I went sideways. I went through it. Yeah. There's always a solution. So greatness to me is that I can leave my mark here when I'm really truly retired, which is probably never, but that, you know, the next generation, mm-hmm. uh, literally it started from my hometown. I wanted Ohio Valley kids. Cause right now when we, when I grew up, it was Dean Martin, Phil Necro and some guys like, you know, they were so much older than us. There was no yeah. one to look up to yeah. right now. There's a kid in Ohio Valley that's lifting weights in a high school gym that could go, I could be like him. Yeah. And, and that is how it started. And that to me was the initial greatness. Like from my, just from, from your hood, from your place where you're from, like everybody's like, I want to be like Corey, but I can still, I can tweet him. I, when he comes back home, I can see him. Like I wanted that. And then init- and then once I got bigger, it's like, I want to be known by the guy that stands by Arnold and Tiger mm-hmm. and that I climbed up with really no one giving me no love, man. There's no lob passes here. Right. This is all work and that's right. what it takes. And so that to me is great. Like in your industry, you're a G. I like it. Corey G, the legend. Thanks for coming on, man. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Appreciate I'll it. Oh, I owe. <laughs> hey, guys. Lewis Howes here, and thanks so much for checking out this video and this interview. I hope you loved it. If you did, make sure to leave a comment below and share this with your friends. Also, I've got a huge announcement. The Summit of Greatness is coming very soon. If you love the School of Greatness podcast, if you love these interviews and you want more, you want to connect with some of these speakers in person, you want to connect with me and other people just like you who watch and listen to these interviews, then make sure to sign up for the Summit of Greatness. Go to summitofgreatness.com to learn more. You can check out more about the video that we have that we created for the summit. There's a link in the description below as well. It's summitofgreatness.com. Check it out right now. I hope to see you there. And again, thanks so much for watching this video.